Hi, I'm Anna, and you're listening to the Climate Press. A podcast where we aim to bring together climate science with public understanding and action. Today on the show, we're joined by eight different atmospheric scientists involved in the exciting Eureka Field campaign taking place in Barbados. With over 200 scientists from around the world, the project aims to advance our understanding of the interplay between clouds, convection, and circulation, along with their role in climate change. Now, we won't be the ones asking the questions today. Instead, we'll be handing over to a special host, Anna Lesbros, a 14-year-old student from France. We hope you enjoy. Hi, Hi. my name is Anna Lesbrus. I'm a French 14 years old student. I'm doing an internship at Leeds University. Uh, The purpose of my work experience is to discover how research is carried out at the university in the United Kingdom. So may I ask you some questions about the Eurekas project? Yes, of course, go ahead. So why is this field campaign necessary? (laughs) The reason for this field campaign is because at the moment, our models for predicting future climate have an uncertainty um, in the temperature change they predict, which is as much as four degrees of uncertainty. So that's a range of uncertainty for future climate at the end of this century. Uh, And the implications of that range are enormous. So at the high end, then it's complete catastrophe, complete, well, maybe the human race can't survive. At the low end, it may be less of a problem, still a problem, but less bad. Um, We don't know where we lie in that range. Um, And some work has been done that shows that the biggest cause, most of that uncertainty is because the, the the models don't capture these shallow clouds well, and they have a very big impact on the energy budget of the Earth. So we think that if we can reduce our uncertainty in these shallow clouds, then we can make a, a better prediction of future climate, and then we can know um, better you know, what our uh, future will hold and how we can take action to, to deal with the worst possible consequences. And that was Professor Doug Parker from the University of Leeds. I'm talking now with Professor Simon Malinowski from the University of Warsaw in Poland. So what's what's your role in the Eureka project? Uh, I am a small part of Eureka project. For years I work with clouds and in particular I am interested in turbulence and turbulent mixing of clouds and uh, environment. And uh, me and my group uh, have uh, very fast response sensors. One of them was mounted on a British Twin Otter mm-hmm. uh, with the resolution better than centimeter to look for the temperature structure of clouds in very, very small scale. And why, why is turbulence important? Why do we need to know more about turbulence? Uh, You you know, uh, cloud consists of very tiny droplets Mm -hmm. and for for each droplet it's not important what is the average properties of uh, clouds, uh, humidity, temperature, saturation or whatever. For each droplet it is important what is in its vicinity. Mm-hmm. So, so the droplets grow or evaporate depending on what it's in, it's in its closest vicinity. So we need really very high resolution information uh, about uh, thermal and possibly uh, moisture structure in clouds, yeah. moist structure of clouds. Mm-hmm. And uh, since we do not have uh, fast enough uh, hygrometers to measure moisture, 
uh, or humidity, uh, we have uh, fast thermometers and uh, they work uh, as a kind of indicators uh, of thermal structure of clouds on small scale. And this thermal structure depends on turbulent mixing of cloud with dry environment. Mm -hmm. When you see the cloud, which consists of such a bubbles, you do not have a crude idea what's inside these bubbles. And if you go to very, very small scales, you can see that these bubbles are filamented, uh, like, you know, small shells of cloud and empty space and so on. And when you fly uh -huh. with a the thermometer through such a cloud, you, you, had, you have huge variations of temperature on very small differences, the distances. So, yeah. so, 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 so we have a very, very small part, which is a bit a site of the project, but it, which is uh, quite important to understand uh, cloud life. And now we have uh, Dr. Rafaela Vogel from LMD in Paris, France, and she's going to tell us why they chose Barbados for the field campaign. One, one way or one, one reason why we chose this location. But in general, the, the clouds are, are quite similar to what we would found in other comparable regions around the globe, which is, which is very nice because then we can, we can assume that what we measure here is not only what we learn from the measurements here is not only applicable to Barbados or the Caribbean, but it's actually applicable to everywhere um, in the subtropics and um, the oceans, which is much more, which will help us understand the bigger picture. This is Professor Alan Blythe from the University of Leeds. Okay, and so how is the project going so far? Have you yeah. had any problems? Yeah. Well, how is it going? It's fantastic. It's an absolutely brilliant project. It's going really, really well. There's so many ships and aircraft and uh, ground-based measurements, uh, kites and all kinds of things. There are measurements being made on all kinds of scales. That, so we're going to be able to put together a really nice story, I think. It it's really is one of the best projects I've been involved in. Yes, there are always problems. There are lots and lots of small-scale problems that to happen for a morning or a whole day. You solve those or not, so usually associated with instruments. There was an interesting problem just before I left in that the, one, of the, one of the aircraft is called a drone. It's a French uh, drone and it, uh, it fell into the sea, stopped working and fell into the sea and they lost it. And also one of the kites, uh, it's a big kite, it's, um, Got lots of instruments on it. It broke, the tether broke, and it fell into the sea as well. And they lost that. So these kind of problems I have to deal with all the time. Do you have any engineer or technician with you to fix your instruments? Well, they, they lost those instruments because I think a big fish ate them. Um, but they, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> But, but uh, yes, we have engineers on the aircraft that fix the problems. Uh, so, for example, uh, when we got the Twin Otter, when it arrived in, in Barbados, it just had new wings put on and um, the wiring in the wings uh, was brand new. It had just been done. And it didn't, didn't quite work for some of the instruments they demand a lot of detail mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't, they didn't work for a while but there's uh, a couple of guys that know exactly what they're doing they poured over a diagram and said oh, it must be this and they fixed it it's really good really impressed This is Dr. Arlene Lang, the director of the Caribbean Meteorological Organization. 
Okay, so, uh, and how is the CMO involved in Girica 4? So, um, this, first of all, I should say what the CMO is. So the Caribbean Meteorological Organization, it's basically an umbrella organization for um, meteorology within the Caribbean. It's weather, water, and climate, really, not just meteorology. And we coordinate joint activities among 16 English-speaking member states. And within those member states, there are national meteorological services. And so the national meteorological services are the main ones who provide daily forecasts. And um, then we also have what we refer to as the organs of the CMO. I'm at the headquarters unit and I um, do things like ensure that there are funds available for the joint facilities such as the radar network and um, the radioson network. Do you know what a radioson is? Or mm -hmm. a rare, it's the balloon instrument, you know, every day, twice a day, all over the world, where the balloons are sent up and attached to those balloons are instruments that measure pressure, temperature, relative humidity, wind, wind speed direction. And those are used um, to put into weather forecast models and also used just for regular forecast, even without the models. They've been used like this for all of the period of modern meteorology. And so we have within the Caribbean a, a number of our member states that are hosts to these weather balloon stations. And so my office basically gathers funds and disperses funds to keep those networks going. And we also have done the same thing with regard to radar, where we developed a project to um, put modern Doppler radars in um, a number of our member states. They're currently in Belize, Barbados, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago. Those radars were um, procured because of a proposal that was made by my predecessors. So um, our office is, um, has been doing these kinds of coordinating activities for some time. And we also have another organ is the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. And they're basically the main technical organ of the CMO. They do research, training. They are the regional climate center, the regional instrumentation center, and also a center of excellence for um, satellite meteorology, as well as um, forecasting of sand and dust. So they are, um, we both, um, as the CIMH and as the CMO headquarters report to a ministerial level body called the Caribbean Meteorological Council. So every year we have to report to them our activities that we're doing. And so we basically are supporting and facilitating activities among the member states from our office. So that is one of the reasons why this particular activity my job is really to bring together the, the forecasters from all the different member states and put together this forecasting activity that allows them to participate in Eureka. And how will the research benefit to the Caribbean? Oh, it will be an immense benefit because primarily what this project is trying to understand is the clouds, um, the trade wind clouds, and these are very common across the Caribbean, but they have an interesting role in that they, they help to distribute heat in the atmosphere, and they also are very good at reflecting heat, the sunlight back to space. So one of, one of the big uncertainties in climate models has to do with clouds and the way that those models represent clouds. So this project is basically providing lots of good observations to help us understand how these clouds operate, how they organize, how they circulate heat, and what different types of organizations mean for how the heat is distributed and how climate might change in the future. So this project really is very, very important for helping us to do a better job with regard to weather and climate prediction. The information coming out of Eureka is also going to be used to improve the weather models as well as the climate models, and we will all benefit from that. 
And now we talk with Dr. Life Denby from the University of Leeds. What is your typical day being like? My typical day? My typical day is quite long. I usually wake up about just before seven, uh, have a look at some emails, have breakfast, then I go to the ops center where I am now. So it's near the airport. We've, we've got a, a number of meeting rooms and internet where all the groups can meet. I run the weather briefing, uh, which starts at nine. Um, and typically Caribbean forecasters will call into that and give a presentation. Then I'll record that, then I'll go to the flight meeting, uh, then we'll take a look at the weather forecast and then I always have a number of jobs in the afternoon so I'm sort of coordinating everything going on here so making sure that everyone knows where they're meant to be Then I do some research try to prepare for things happening next week um, then we usually if there's been a flight we'll have a flight briefing and later in the day then we we'll go out for dinner and then I do my emails from about nine o'clock to about one or two <laughs> so it's a long day <laughs> um and if i'm flying all of that is different because if you're flying then the day before you spend the large part of that day planning the flight and and during the day you're obviously in the air so you know you go there if we fly say yesterday we flew at nine o'clock i think we set off forget now you you basically leave two hours before the departure because you have to get to the airport to talk to the pilot through, you have, he has to check the whole plane and you have to go off into the air. And then the flight takes four hours and you come back and have to refuel for about an hour. And then you have a debrief. So then your day is very different on a flying day. Okay. But the, but the, but that's, it's very variable. I mean, every day is quite different here. There's always, then there's social activities or seminars or, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, what does it feel like to fly in a research aircraft? Uh, it's a little nerve wracking, but it's also very exciting because I, you know, I get to say to the pilot, I want to fly into that cloud. And unless it has, a, unless his radar says that it's very dangerous to go into it. So if he says there's dragons in there, it would be purple on the radar. Then we go into it, you know. I, I, it's om it almost feels like you're flying yourself because he will just direct the plane there and you go in. And the experience of, uh, you, we, we're studying the rain formation process. So the experience of the rain being different depending where you go into the cloud, uh, all of that is very, uh, it's very visceral, you know. Instead of numbers, you really use. In the in the lower down the cloud, you see the droplets are really big because there's big splatters in the window. <laughs> So it's a very clear, it's a very close connection to the science that you're doing. The actual experience of flying is quite interesting too, because the Twin Otter is quite small. If you, I don't know if you looked at pictures of it. It's a very compact aircraft. When we took off, it was almost like sprinting. It has such a short time it needs to go along the runway, and then it just goes, whoosh. and it can tie, it turns so sharply as well. And the other thing is that. We can fly really low. We can fly down to 50 feet, which is 15 meters above the sea surface, which is so close that actually the wings would almost touch if you if you tipped over completely. And that is just incredible. You're just really resuming along right at the ocean surface. Uh, yeah. So it's quite it's quite surreal. Um, but at the same hand, you sort of you know that you know you have a scientific objective and and. And uh, you're, you're, you know, time up there is limited, and you're trying to chase these clouds. And they're usually the best when you see them at a distance. You're like, oh, that one over there looks really good. But then it takes 10 minutes to get over there. And so it's uh, quite hard to sort of work out how to navigate through them to get the much, as much out of it. So sorry, that was quite a long answer, but <laughs> it's a lot of feelings. This is Analia Albright, PhD student at LMD in Paris. Can you tell us more about the aircrafts? Um, yeah, so there's five aircrafts, um, five airplanes from five different countries. Um, so there's the ATR from France, Halo from Germany, uh, the WP3 from the US, the Twin Otter from the UK, um, and some a flight, an airplane from the Barbados Regional Security Service. Um, and I've had the chance to fly on two of them. Um, I felt so lucky. It was like a really cool experience. Um, I was on the French aircraft, um, the ATR which flies pretty low in the atmosphere, like less than one kilometer. 
um, and it flies at the base of clouds, um, trying to gather data there. Um, and then it also, it can go down to like 60 meters above the ocean, um, which was a little bit scary <laughs> because you feel like if the plane were to turn a little bit, <laughs> the wing could have like touched the ocean. <laughs> and you can see like the waves breaking. Um, yeah, we stayed there for maybe like 10 minutes, um, but yeah, it was very cool. Um, and then I also had the opportunity um, to fly on the US plane, the P3. Um, it's actually, there's two of them in the world and they're designed to measure hurricanes. Um, so they're really strong. They can withstand like wind, strong wind speeds and wow. strong differences in wind uh, with altitudes like wind, it's called wind shear. Um, and in Barbados, they were flying at night. Actually, it was from, my flight was from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, because there's actually a lot of variability, like the cloud, amount of cloud changes over the course of the day. And there's actually a lot of, a lot of cloudiness at night. Um, and so the P3 was trying to sample that. And it was timed so that it would happen during the full moon. Um, so we nicknamed it like the werewolf <laughs> flight. <laughs> and, um, it was at night because, uh, sorry, during the full moon, because um, then that gives us the best chance of like there being enough light to actually see the clouds. Um, and the night that I was flying, like it, I was surprised like how light um, and how clear the air was not very polluted um, it was. And I got to sit in the cockpit for a few hours. Um, they have three pilots in the front and then two seats for visitors. Um, and so they just let us kind of sit behind them and watch. Um, oh, that's great. It was really cool. It felt like Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass. Um, yeah, and I think they got some great measurements. So I'll look forward to working with their data as well. Well, I think you have a lot of work now analyzing all the yeah, yeah. data that <laughs> collected. That's true, yeah. Um, and then the yeah Twin Otter, it's really like cloud chasing. Um, it goes through the clouds and it's small, so it's pretty flexible. Um, Halo, the German flight flies high in circles and drops these like drop zones. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Barbados airplane, um, we nicknamed it like the spy plane um, because they have a really high tech, uh, really high resolution camera um, that's actually, it's usually surveying uh, drug trafficking, um, but they were flying above, the Barbados plane was flying above the French and the British airplanes um, and taking these incredible high resolution videos of the clouds, but also of the airplanes. Wow. Um, it was amazing. Like we saw some of the videos, and just the airplanes look so small um, in these clouds, which <laughs> can be kilometers or even up to like a hundred kilometers. Some of these cloud patterns, cloud structures. Um, so it was pretty humbling to see. Like we're so, so small, we're sampling something that is much bigger um, than we are. But yeah, I think also just really nice, nice images there. Um, and it also shows like the international collaboration that's going on in this campaign. Um, and no one is doing something <clears throat> twice. Like every everyone has a, a role and it really fits into the, the bigger picture of the campaign. Um, and it's like a really cohesive international collaboration. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing that Bjorn and Sondlin have and others have organized. Yeah, I think it's 11 countries, 50 institutions. So it's yeah, pretty incredible, the field campaign. Talk with Dr. Sandrine Bonny from LMD Paris as well. And so, um, have you made any discovery? Something that <laughs> I don't know if it's a discovery, but we were quite surprised by the fact that we found more clear sky than we thought in this area. Mm -hmm. When preparing the the experiment, we had looked a lot at satellite observations, data from the Barbados Cloud Observatory, and so on. And we had the impression that days with clear sky was ver were very rare. And uh, actually, when we started our first flights, we had a lot of clear sky. <laughs> so maybe it was just because we were measuring things in a particular area. And so, it, but uh, that was a little bit of a surprise for many of us. Um, no, but uh, otherwise, I think maybe one surprising thing is 
uh, how how heavy the showers can be here. Uh, so they come from shallow clouds. They can be very very uh, intense. That's uh, quite amazing. Um, we were we've well we 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 also saw that the the cloud fraction at the cloud base, uh, which is what we wanted to measure specifically for this campaign, is uh, very variable from one day to the next, which is uh, very nice and very interesting for us. Um, and yeah, maybe the, the, the most um, surprising thing is that now that we are almost touching the end of the campaign, that we realize that we've managed to do virtually everything that we had planned to do during the campaign. <laughs> That's a very nice surprise. <laughs> and uh, did you have optimal weather conditions all along? Um, yes, I think we can be quite happy with the conditions we encountered. And and because we have we had a vi variety of different conditions, and that's actually what we what we were looking for. We wanted to take measurements in as diverse conditions as possible. But this will be important to get a robust theory or a robust understanding of the governing processes. Because if we only have one kind of situation that we measure, we might just try to find explanations for just this kind of condition. But if you have a different uh, variety of conditions, you really need to have very robust explanations, which can also explain the relationship between the clouds and the environment um, in slightly different conditions. And I think that will make um, understanding and the understanding that we gain, and maybe theories that will come out of this project, will make them more, much more robust and. Um, representative for um, yeah, a variety of cases. So we had days with strong winds, with a lot of precip. So during two days, right after our arrival, it was kind of raining the entire time and we didn't see the sun for an entire day. But then on other days, we also had hardly any clouds. And you can imagine we have a lot of scientists which have instruments to measure clouds. And when we fly for four and a half hours and we hardly see any clouds, of course, everyone is very disappointed in the end. So sometimes we had to then maybe go to the beach in the evening to relax and to spend some, some good time after having had maybe a slightly boring flight. <laughs> and everyone is so very excited about their measurements. So when they cannot measure anything, that's, of course, very boring. But it's just part of, as I try to say, it's part of the variability in conditions that we have. So it's also good to document a day without clouds. Yeah. And it's also interesting in the end to understand why sometimes we might have a day without any clouds. Yeah. Okay. So what are the most exciting things about this project? I think for me, the most exciting is that we have so many different instruments. So the, you know, the um, so it's, it's you know you, you get an idea that we we have a really good potential to really understand these things because we're not just measuring it in one way we have all these complementary things together, and I think maybe that's a sort of physicist in me but like trying to understand how these instruments work and how they work well together and what they can tell us I think is really cool. Um, that's probably for me the yeah that's the most exciting thing. I mean, I, you know, like I said, working with people is, is also really fantastic, but it's it's really just, you know, that as, as an example, the Germans brought over a, um, it's like a construction kit for a radar. They had two container metal boxes, and out of this came pieces that we, as a group, went down and assembled a big radar, and now that's scanning out over the ocean. And so we can see all our planes fly through, and we can see exactly the clouds are going to fly through from the radar. I just think that's fantastic, you know, being able to, it's a bit like a scout camp, you know, you go there and like you've put up a tent and like you make a din dining table and you have all the bits that you really need. It's the same here. We've like taken all this kit to one place and now pff, we can do all this. Yeah. Um, so I read that the in your group in Poland, 
uh, you have to develop this temperature probe that it can take measurements of in the clouds at a rate of a thousand measurements per second. In fact, can we you... record yeah much faster. Uh, we, we record much faster since we recorded 20,000 measurements per second. Uh, the story is the following, that there is some interference uh, of the thermometers, which has uh, their very simple resistance thermometer, but they act as very small antennas. And you have many navigational systems on the aircraft, which produces a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. If you record at higher frequencies, then uh, the sensor is able to record temperature, then you can filter out all unnecessary information. And like just, noise. Like noise, yes. And, and so this is why we record much faster, even if our sensor uh, responses, you know, real responses for about 2,000 uh, samples per second. Mm -hmm. Uh, was there any weather in event in the past which severity was not predicted by forecasting models that had a lot of impact? Um, oh, there are always those. There, there. I should say that there isn't um, an infallible forecast. <laughs> so <laughs> our forecasts always have an element of uncertainty with them. Um, one of the things that we do in our offices, we um, collaborate with Meteor France. We actually have a formal set of working arrangements between the CMO and Meteor France that was signed in 2016. We've had many years of collaboration with them, but this was formalized in 2016. And one of the projects that we are co-chairing with Meteor France Martinique is the severe weather forecast program for the Eastern Caribbean. And what that program tr is trying to capture is provision of forecasts for non-tropical cyclone severe weather. So we have a very good hurricane warning system and we have a hurricane committee that has been meeting now for 41 years. So each year the hurricane committee meets um, and it's all of the countries that are affected by hurricanes in our region. So it's everywhere from Canada to Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, all of these countries and all of the islands of the Caribbean, as well as Bermuda. And we all get together um, for a meeting where we discuss the operational plan, to ensure everybody has their backup. Should they be affected by a hurricane? Who will take over for their forecasting responsibility? Do they have all of their instruments in place to make their balloon launches? Because during a hurricane, they actually make extra balloon launches. And so we have for the hurricane warning system many years of experience. So we do not have any surprises for hurricanes. Hurricanes, the surprise has been mostly with regard to intensity. So for example, Hurricane Maria intensified very close to Dominica. So the forecast had been for uh, minimal hurricane, but it intensified very quickly and of course caused tremendous devastation and, and a number of deaths um, as it intensified very close to land. And that was not forecasted well. So the intensification of tropical cyclones still remains a concern, but the forecast track has been much improved through the decades. And so I would say the main surprise would be in terms of intensity. Mm -hmm. not in terms of where the forecast, where the storm should be going so much. There's been tremendous amounts of improvement with that. Um, for the severe weather forecast project, which is aimed at non-hurricane events, we had an event in December of 2013 that affected many islands and in which some 18 people lost their lives. Um, it was referred to as a Christmas storm because it happened over the 24th and 25th of December 2013. And that event was one of the impetus for creating the severe weather forecast program in the Eastern Caribbean. Because um, there was no coordinated response to that event, and it was recognized after that there needed to be a coordinated response to an event like this, which could be just as deadly as hurricanes are, but it's happening in December. It's happening any time of year.
Is there any immediate use of the data you're collecting? Um, yes, 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 actually, in real time. So the, the Halo aircraft goes round in a circle and it drops, it drops sons. So they drop a sond, what's called a sond, out the back of the aircraft. Uh, the aircraft's up at, uh, oh, what is it? It's, it's really high, uh, 32,000 feet, something like that. I think about the level that the commercial airlines fly, roughly. And so it measures a good part of the atmosphere. And people on the ground, in, uh, for the other aircraft, the French aircraft, they, it's called the ATR for short, uh, they would like to know the best where where the what's called the lifting condensation level is roughly where the bottom of the cloud is. So they want to know the level that they should fly at, so they want to be very close to the the base of the cloud, so they can calculate these numbers from the drop zones in real time. So that's already one use, but other people are making all kinds of use of the current weather and uh, relative humidity measurements. Uh, satellite observations have already got uh, got some analysis going. And uh, so, do you have other ways to communicate your work with the rest of the world? Um, <laughs> that's also a great question. Um, yeah, I guess the goal of scientific writing is to have it. Um, be as clear um, as possible that um, even though there will be technical words um, and a bit of jargon that maybe someone uh, is a different a scientist from a different field or someone who really doesn't have such a background in atmospheric science or the scent or physics in general um, could understand um, and understand like uh, the importance um, or how this piece of research uh, pushes like the frontier of knowledge forward. Um, but yeah, I think that's an open question of um, how best to communicate science. Yeah, it's a big question. Um, I think that's also a reason that we like to go to schools um, because then you can communicate your work, um, like really communicate the big picture. Um, I think there's an Einstein quote, like if you can't, or paraphrasing, like if you can't explain something to a child, you don't uh, understand it well enough to yeah. really grasp like the essence of what you're trying to um, communicate um, by explaining it to younger students. Um, so yeah, I think it's different strategies that you write scientific papers, mostly to communicate with other scientists, um, but also keeping in mind the importance of um, outreach, like visiting schools or maybe writing um, blog posts. We also have a blog. Um, if you look on the Eureka website, um, there are different blog posts mm -hmm. where people talk a little bit more about like a day in a life, day in the life of someone on one of the research vessels, like one of the boats, um, a day in the life of someone on an airplane. Um, and so people will be writing scientific papers about the results that come from these drops on measurements, um, but then also writing blog posts that are a little bit more accessible to a wider audience. Um, and then um, one of the guys uh, one of the PhD students, PhD students who's really an expert on this, um, his name is Geet George. Um, he was also going to schools and he brought a drop sound along with him so kids could really just touch it and see what is this and like <laughs> um, just have a more like tactile, um, concrete sense of what scientific research looks like. Okay, last question. Uh, what are the next steps for the project? Mm -hmm. We've got a tremendous amount of data to analyze, and that's going to be our next step. Uh, we're really pushing hard to get a good quality data set from our aircraft and the ground-based measurements. Uh, it's uh, quite, quite tricky and quite involved, but we're going to push really hard to get something out, get a complete data set by in six months. And it's very important to do this because there's a lot of groups that would like like our data. It's the only aircraft that's making such detailed cloud microphysics data. And so people looking, using radars and lidars, etc., from the other aircraft uh, and cameras, 
depolarization cameras, they would like to know the details of the clouds that we're measuring. So it's very important that we get this done quickly and do a good job of uh, quality control. So that's the next step. And of course, uh, as well, there'll be people uh, figuring out which models to run and how to construct the models um, and hopefully start running the models. And we'll be thinking as well about, the, so, so they'll be doing that on, on for models on different scales, including the, the local cloud scale. And we'll also be thinking about the science questions. So what's come out of this and what we, what we can address with the data that, that we have. Well, uh, I think it's uh, really exciting to, 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 to be in this group of scientists from, from many, many countries and we have really good, you know, friendly collaborations here and I think this experiment is great. I don't know uh, what uh, the outcome will be, but I hope that we will learn a lot about clouds which will help us to better model clouds in weather and climate studies. And would you have any tips for a high school student that wants to study meteorology or atmospheric science? <laughs> study mathematics and physics. <laughs> 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 yes, and, and look around. Yeah. Since the world is interesting, it's beautiful, and methodology is about uh, applying mathematics and physics uh, to study your closest environment. I can just say that I'm very happy with the way the campaign has been doing so far. Yeah. Um, and again, I think the spirit, uh, the cooperative spirit among uh, all the partners has been uh, really essential. And uh, that's, yeah, that's very encouraging for, for the future as well. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Merci à toi. <laughs> Thanks. Uh... Thanks for that. That was really nice. On the next episode, we'll be speaking with Alexis Percival from the Yorkshire Ambulance Service and Dr. Callum Swift from Irish Doctors for the Environment about the role and responsibilities of our health systems in confronting the climate emergency. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes and visit our website, theclimatepress.com. This podcast is available on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, SoundCloud, Pocket Casts and Radio Public. Thank you to all the artists who contributed music to this episode. For more information, please see the website. See you soon. And remember, make love, not CO2.